back, everybody. It's Wednesday. It's uh, time to finish up our unit on imperative programming. So today, um, we're going to talk about just a couple of wrap-up things. Um, and then we'll talk a little, this is sort of a little bit of Java internals today. A little bit more about, you know, how, what's actually happening when you run your program. When you hit the play button on Android Studio, when you submit to our, you know, online playground, whatever. Right? So a little bit about the steps that are taking place and the kind of information that Java is generating in, in both bases. Like, this is important to understand. We've been hiding the details a little bit from you, but I kind of want to show you a little bit more today about what's going to happen. So we're going to do a demo to accomplish that. Um, all right, so let's, there's a couple of more things that uh, we need to wrap up from our discussion of imperative programming. These are, um, you know, when we, when we went through looking at different looping and conditional statements and, and constructs, um, what I've showed you are the common cases. I've showed you the things that real programmers actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's a couple of other things I just want you to see quickly um, because they're out there. They're not very common. But it's also a good chance for us to review a little bit some of our imperative programming basics. So the first loop that we met was this while loop, right? The while loop has the structure where it checks a condition um, that's a Boolean statement that's inside those parentheses. As long as that condition remains true, it will repeat whatever you put inside that block. So it says, while this condition is true, repeat this block of code. Every time I get back to the top, I check the condition. Now, what's the, what's the minimum number of times that a while loop will execute? Good potential quiz or midterm question. Yeah, way in the back. Zero. The condition's not true, I don't enter the block at all. If the first time I arrive at the while loop, the condition is false, I never execute the block of code. I just jump to the bottom and keep going. There is a variant of the while loop that's out there in the world that you might see in some of your programs in the future, right? And this can be useful sometimes. So this is something called a do while loop. You see it's got two keywords, right? It's got a do statement that opens up a block and then at the end of the block, now I have this while condition. So the condition that I'm checking is moved to the bottom, the while keyword is moved to the bottom, and the way I open up this looping construct is by saying do, and then providing a block of code. Without knowing anything more about this, what do you think the difference is here? You only want to speculate, right? Think about, look at it, right? Think about where the condition is relative to the block of code. Right? Someone give me a hypothesis about the differences between these two loops. Very similar. It's going to continue to execute as long as the condition is true. What's different? Yeah. Okay, so this is a, yeah, well, uh, let me, um, let me save that answer, which is correct, for a minute from now. Structurally, what's different about this? Remember, the, you know, these com computer programming languages are designed by human beings. They want you. They're rooting for you. They want you to succeed. They're not trying to confuse you. There actually are languages out there that are intentionally trying to confuse and frustrate you. I'm not kidding. Somebody, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Anyway, I could talk about this offline. But people have written these, like, programming languages for fun that are designed to be frustrating and make you irritated. But Java was not trying to do that. Java was trying to be helpful. So from a structural perspective, I'm just thinking about, remember, you know, my code is executing most of the time from top to bottom. I execute a line, and unless I'm inside a loop and I've gotten to the block, bottom of the loop, and I need to return to the top, I'm just going to keep going straight down, one line at a time. So the fact that this condition, so here the condition is at the top of the block, the fact that the condition is now located below the block might lead me to suspect what? Yeah. Yeah, it's checked after the block. So in a while loop, I check the condition before I enter the block. And as long as the condition is true, I keep going. With the do while loop, I check the condition at the end. So I do whatever is in the block. And then when I get to the bottom, I say, is this condition true? If the condition is false, I stop. And then I keep going. 
So the big difference here is that a while loop, like we said, the minimum number of times a while loop will execute is zero, because if the condition is false, I'll just skip it all together. What about a do while loop? What can I guarantee about that? A while loop, well, there's some while loops do not have to execute, whereas a do while loop will always execute at least, at least once, exactly. Thank you to both of you for the correct answer. Yeah. So I'm gonna check the condition at the bottom. So even the condition is false, by the time I've checked it for the first time, I've already executed the block. And this can be useful in certain scenarios, right? Um, so you see here, I've got two loops, my condition here is i is less than zero, i is zero, so this loop I should never enter. And you'll see I don't. I don't see the print statement from inside the while loop. The do while loop, on the other hand, same setup. i is still zero, or I set reset i to zero on line six, then I have this do while loop, but because it's of its different structure, I'm going to do the block first and then check the condition afterwards. Okay, so that's our first little bit of imperative programming rat. All right, so. We had one new looping construct to introduce. We also have one new um, conditional uh, uh, form to introduce. So you guys have seen if statements, right? And we know that we can chain these together to test any one of a number of conditions. And again, just to remind you, you know, as you guys are working on the MP and if you, you know, preparing for the midterm next week, um, in an if statement, how many of the branches or arms are executed? One, who wants to, the answer to this question is slightly more complicated than that. The maximum is one, the minimum is zero, and what does it depend on? What would you have to ask me? I said, okay, I've got an if statement here, how many branches are gonna be executed? What's the next question you ask me so that you can tell me an exact answer? Well, I don't even know, need to know anything about the condition. Right? That would be helpful to understand which one's gonna be executed. But if I just say, I've got an if state in my, in, in my code, how many times does it execute? Well, you know it has to execute either zero or one, but you can refine the answer further. Yeah. Is there an else statement? Right? Remember, I can have one else statement. If there's an else statement, how many branches get executed? One and always one. Because even if none of the conditionals match, I enter the else. If there's no else statement, how many statements get executed? Zero or one. There, I do need to know kind of exactly what the conditional is to be able to answer the question. But an if statement that has an else will always execute one branch, because the else gets hit if nothing else matches. So if you find yourself writing a very long, and you know, I've done this, I've been there, you know, I try to avoid it now, but um, if you find yourself writing a really long if statement, I actually saw some code recently that had an if statement that had like 30 arms, and I was like, what's going on? There's probably a better way to do that. But anyway, if you find yourself doing this, and you have lots and lots and lots of conditions, and you're checking something like really straightforward, Java provides a different way of doing this. So this is a new conditional statement. It's called switch. We're going to have to talk about switch for a minute, because switch has some unmute kind of interesting behavior. Okay. So here's how switch works. I open up a switch statement with the switch keyword, another reserved word in Java, I can't name a variable that. And then I have a variable that I need to put inside this expression. And then what I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to enumerate cases that match that variable. So essentially when variable is equal to A, then I'm going to execute the block of code that's here, right? Otherwise, if it executes B, I'm gonna execute the block of code that's here. Now, here's what's interesting about switch in Java. And you may decide that this is um, a nice feature or something that's just really confusing. There's a couple of things. First of all, the thing that goes inside the switch, the thing that, that I'm testing has to be either a primitive type or a string. I can't test a more complicated expression. So I can use it to test like ints and longs, doubles, or string variables. Um, characters, for example. Um, I can also match multiple cases um, in a single switch state. I'll show you why. Or I can also execute multiple cases, right? When I execute a switch statement, I, 
I find what Java does is it finds a case that matches, and then it starts executing the code there, and it continues until it gets to a break. And this is important. Um, we'll see an example of this in a minute. All right, so let's look at this. All right, so remember that about the break statement. I need to use a break to exit my switch. All right, so I've got a switch statement here, it starts on line two. I'm switching on the value of this variable test, which I declared on line one, and initialized to be two, so int. I've got four cases, and then in the switch statement, I can also provide something like an else, it's called default. So default is uh, matched if nothing else matches. It's not mandatory, it's just like an if-else statement. I don't have to provide an else or not. What do you think is going to be printed here? Who can get me started? Let's just talk through what's gonna happen. So my switch statement, um, I'm switching on the value of test, so which case matches? Case two that I've defined on line five, in this particular example, because I initialized test to be two, okay? So what's the first thing the program does? It prints C. Then what happens? And this is, again, this is where it gets a little strange. You might think it exits, but is there a break there? I don't see any breaks anywhere. So what Java will do is it'll just keep going. So what you're gonna see is it's actually going to print C, D, and E. It finds the right spot to start, but because I don't have a break, it doesn't leave. It just keeps executing code until it gets to the bottom of the switch state. What if I use something like, let's try something like five. All right, so now what do you guys think is gonna happen? Do any of my case statements match? All right, but I have a default statement, right? So here what's gonna happen is I'm gonna hit the default statement, print E, and then exit. If I remove my default statement, um, it's gonna complain that I need this. So I'm gonna put this back. I misspoke a minute ago when I talked about switch statements, I apologize, I do need a default statement. I will enforce this. All right, so I don't use these very often. I forget the semantics. Um, now, let's try this. Let's put in a break statement after um, case one, and let's see what happens. So now when I switch on zero, I enter the switch statement, I start at the first case, I print A, then I move on to the next case and I print B, and then I break. So I actually don't get to the C and the D and the E. If I switch on one, what's gonna happen is I'm only gonna print B, same thing. Now, once I get to two, I've jumped over that break statement and I'm starting in case two, so I print C, I print D, I print E, and then finally I get to the end. Any questions about this? This is, again, this, this behavior is uh, different than a FL statement, and kind of strange, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, you know, what can I do in a switch statement? Uh, don't do really complicated stuff, right? This is usually a good way to like, just, you know, set one variable or something like that, or do one action. Um, you don't want to put really complicated stuff in a, in a Java case statement. You really can't, right, because all it takes is a value, right? Um, so, for example, let's say you had a character and you were trying to map it to an int. You might have a big switch statement that looks like this just to do that, right? Good question. Are there other questions? Yeah. Anything that's not a string or a primitive type. Nothing we've talked about yet, but next week when we start talking about how you can create new types in Java by defining classes, you can't use those here. Yeah, it's a great question. So everything you've seen up till now will work, right? So let's make test a string, right? And now Java's gonna know that it has to be a string and so it's actually going to check my cases for me to make sure that it works, right? And now I can use things like, you know, maybe you're trying to count the number of times your buddy says this to you on Something like, you know, it's like I can put things inside the, I don't know why it thinks it has tab characters, it doesn't have tab characters. Let's put it right there, please. Thank you. Yeah. So I can test strings too, right? But I can't test any of the more complicated objects that we'll talk about starting next week. So yeah, so all the data you've seen, well, arrays, like I can't test an array, 
right? So I could create an array of events. I can't use that inside a switch state. Right? Has to be like a literal single value, either a primitive type, or this is one of the other places in Java where strings get special treatment. Other questions? I feel like we've talked about switch statements for far long enough. All right, any other questions about, this is it. Like, Friday is review. Uh, we'll do some homework problems. We'll take questions. I don't really have, you know, plan to have a huge plan for Friday's um, class before the first midterm. But any questions on anything related to imperative programming? You guys get another chance to ask on Friday. I really want you, uh, to you guys to do well on next week's midterm. I mean, overall, the class is doing really well. People have done great on the MP so far. I know some of you have some finishing up to do, but a lot of you are pretty close to being done. Um, so I think you guys are in a great place to really do a fantastic job on next week's midterm. That's, and that's what I want, right? I'm rooting for you guys. I want to help you as much as possible. So any questions now? Uh, any, you know, things I can, you know, help out with that might aid in your preparation or concepts that might still seem slippery? All right, again, we have Friday to do that as well, so I'll give you guys some time to think about it. Okay, so now, you know, again, this is not a course on Java internals. Right? I try to do my best in this class to avoid, I, I, I wanna teach you how to uh, communicate with the computer, right? And as we go forward, once we get to the unit on objects, which starts next Monday, and then when we talk about algorithms and data structures at the end of the class, you guys will have a chance to do other parts of being a computer scientist. Like think about how to structure data and how to model data. and Think about how different algorithms perform under certain conditions and stuff like that. We'll get there, right? Um, but for the first part of the class, our focus has really been on, you know, bringing you up to speed and teaching you how to program in Java. And I don't like to talk very much about kind of what's going on behind the scenes because I think it's confusing. Um, and sometimes a little bit frightening. But there's a few places where it can actually um, help you understand what's happening. And so today I'm gonna spend just a few minutes now um, talking about what actually happens when you uh, run a piece of Java code. And going forward, we're gonna try to be a little bit more clear when we talk about this process. So far, you know, when you guys submit your code to the playground or to Prairie Learn or whatever, or to you know, working on the MP, these two steps are both happening, but we've been lumping them together. But I do want to separate them so that we can talk about them a little bit more intelligently. All right. And, you know, again, I hope that some of you are curious about this. In fact, I hope many of you are curious about this, right? Uh, you know, as you, one of the things that's a really exciting part of your journey into computer science is starting to become familiar with how things actually work, right? When you are getting started, you're using all this stuff that sort of seems magical. And then at a certain point, you start to realize, I can understand pretty much all of this. And that's a really empowering feeling, right? Understanding like, hey, I can understand how Facebook works, right? I get it, you know? I don't know all the details, but I get it, right? There's nothing about it that I can't understand, right? Or the other websites I use, or some of the software packages that I use as part of, you know, whatever I'm doing, right? You can understand that stuff. It's all just code written by human beings just like you, and you will write some of it, a lot of it, hopefully, in the future. And again, this will help clear up a few misconceptions, and it's super interesting, right? Or at least I think it's interesting. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to wander too far off script here and go into long digressions, but I am capable of that. If you want that sort of thing, come by office hours, and you can have as much of it as you can take. Um, all right, so let's talk about what happens when you run a Java program, okay? So when you submit it to our playground, when you click Submit on Prairie Learn, when you hit the Play button on Android Studio, the process has two steps that are common to all of these environments, okay? The first step is something called compilation. Your code is compiled, okay? This is not executing your code. Instead, what happens is that there's a program, again, a piece of computer software, that takes the Java source code, what we've been training you to write, the if statements and the else statements and the variable declarations and the function declarations and all that, it takes that and it tries to transform it into a different type of code, okay? Or essentially, this is like translation. Um, we don't call it translation because compilation usually, uh, what it does is it produces a much simpler representation of your code, okay? So what happens in Java is that there's a program, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, called Java C, this is the Java compiler, okay? When you install it on your machine, you run it by typing Java C. 
Java C takes your file containing Java source code and it compiles it, or it tries to, okay, into something that's called Java bytecode, right? Now, it's possible that the Java compiler cannot understand what you wrote. And this is pretty common. A lot of the errors you guys have been seeing are what are we call compiler errors. It means at this stage of the process, Java C can't understand what you're trying to get it to do. And this usually happens because you forgot a brace or you forgot a semicolon, right? But if you think about it, if you just write gobbledygook into the file, like let's say you write a poem. Some of you guys should try this sometime in the CBTF, right? Just write me a nice note and see if that gets full credit. Um, Java C is like, I have no idea what this is, right? It could be like totally beautiful poetry that would like move somebody to tears, but Java C is like, I don't know. I don't see an if statement there, so I don't know what to do with this. Um, if your code can't compile, then there's no way for us to go on. So we have to stop here. We can't get to the second step. The, f the second step of this process is entirely dependent on the first step. The first step fails, the second step does not happen, okay? The second part is execution. So again, running your code consists of first compiling it and then executing it. Executing it is what actually will produce a result. So now we take the output from the first stage of the process, which is this compiled bytecode, and we'll show you some of that in a minute, and then we run it. And in order to do that, we use another piece of software, and this is kind of an, an interesting um, historical legacy of Java that I'll try to explain in a minute. Um, but it's run by a program called the Java Virtual Machine, okay? Um, and this is when you install it on your computer, typically, uh, available to you under the name Java. So Java C takes your Java source code and compiles it into bytecode. Java takes the bytecode and tries to execute that. Right? Now, any problems that occur at this stage are called runtime errors. All right? And these, I think we talked about this a little bit before, but these are, these are more problematic than compiler errors. Right? Because here's the point. So you might think, at what point do I send my code to somebody else to use? Like, what happens before the app that you install on your phone arrives from the Play Store? And before things are distributed, this is what's done. We compile the code. And actually, there's a bunch of other steps, but you can think of it as basically a more complex form of compilation. Then you take the code and you try to run it on your device. And so any errors that occur there are visible to the user. So these compiler errors really typically are only visible to the developers. That means you messed up and you gotta fix it and you, you keep going. You guys have dealt with plenty of those so far. These runtime errors are the ones that are visible to users. So this is what causes the crashes and the bug reports and you know people uninstalling your application, stuff like that, right? All right, so let's look at some examples of these, right? Um, so you know, so here again, like like, you can write this. You know, this is valid text, you know? Like, Java programs are just text, right? So I can write this. Nothing's gonna, bad's gonna happen, right? But, you know, <laughs> clearly, the Java compiler has really no idea what to do with this information, right? This is not a Java program, right? In order for the Java compiler to understand us, we have to use these uh, syntactic rules that we've been learning. Right? If we don't do that, we can't just write, like, you could write this out on a piece of paper and give it to, you know, a friend. Don't do that. Uh, we will find you. Um, and they could potentially complete this, this instruction, but Java can't. Right? Um, so it doesn't understand human speech yet, right? Um, so this, so, you know, here it's just like, I didn't even try, right? This is a different kind of problem. This is going to produce a compiler error. Why? Yeah, I've got, I, I have an inconsistency in my program. So one of the things that's happening during compilation is that the Java compiler is checking stuff. And this is one of the things that makes compilation so powerful, is that the compiler can help you find mistakes. So here, either I wanted, either the right type for instructions is a string, or I've initialized it properly. Because I've got a string literal on the right side of my assignment and an int variable type on the left side. So something's wrong. 
And the Java compiler can find this for us, right? It'll helpfully tell us um, this is, th there's something wrong here. I don't know what you were trying to do, but this doesn't make any sense. You declared a vendor variables and int, you tried to assign a string literal to it. So this is a compiler error. And this is an example of the type of things about your program that the compiler can help you find, right? Now, again, if you guys, you know, you guys that have been using Python before, in Python, it's like if I take a variable and I assign an int to it, and then later I decide I want it to be a string, that's cool. Like, Python's just like, okay, fine. I hope you know what you're doing. Um, Java's a little bit, yeah, Java's not gonna let you get away with that. Right? It's, it, and, and to be honest, you know, if, if you are coming from a Python background, you might have found all of these Java rules to be pretty irritating. Trust me, after 20 years, it's one of the reasons I don't write Python anymore. It's too frightening, right? Like, the, the, there's no, Python doesn't really have a compiler, and so it's very difficult for it to help you find problems like this. All right. Um, now, there are other types of problems that the compiler is not going to help me find. So let's see what's happening here. So I have a string variable called s, and I'm initializing it to null. That's that special empty value that's caused so many problems for us over the years. And then immediately afterwards on line two, what am I doing? I'm taking that string, and I'm trying to call the length method that it provides. And strings have this length method along with caret, some other things. That'll make more sense to us when we talk about, start talking about objects next week. But I know that I can't call that on a string that's null. So now what you're seeing is something that's called a runtime error. So this, you know, again, I just want you to, you, these look a little different, right? This is a compiler error. The code did not run. When you submit to our playground, we compile the code and then we try to execute it immediately if it compiled. Um, so these look very similar to you, um, but they're not. In this case, the code compiled, and when I tried to run it, this is what happened. I, I had this null pointer exception. So this is a runtime error. This said the program crashed. And again, this is the type of thing that we try to avoid uh, when we're writing our programs in a variety of ways. And so one of the things that's happened in language design, and this is happening in Java too, like Java you know, is releasing new versions. As a language, the Java programming language has continued to evolve, and I'm actually gonna show you one of its new features in a few minutes. Um, so a lot of the languages that have come after Java, so Java's an old language. Um, I can't remember when the release date for it was, but it was like in the 80s. Um, it's been around a while. A lot of the new, newer languages have, basically you can think of them as having one goal. They want the compiler to catch as many problems as possible. So anything that used to be something that would happen at runtime that would cause the code to crash, if my compiler can tell that that's going to happen, the compiler should stop me from doing that. So for example, this piece of code. Modern compilers will not compile this, right? Because they're like, look, you may think I'm dumb, but I'm not dumb, right? I saw what you did there. You had a string, you set it to null, and then literally on the next line, you tried to dereference it. There is no way that that's ever going to work. So a more modern compiler will actually stop you right there. It won't run the code, it won't compile the code. It'll say, nope, you need to fix this. I'm not talking about Java, Java still has this problem, but newer languages will not allow this to happen, right? They're smart enough, the compiler knows enough about the code as it's compiling it to check for stuff like this, right? Obviously, you know, look, this is a really dumb mistake, but I can show you slightly more complicated versions of this that are equally dumb that uh, Java still doesn't detect, but it can't even find the simple one. So what's the goal of kind of like trying to transform, you know, compiler errors into, sorry, runtime errors into compiler errors? This goes back to what I said before. Compilation happens when the program is being developed. When you guys are working on your, like, at the end of the semester, you guys will have a fully working version of the Campus Snake app. At that point, you could deploy that on the Play Store. Before you did that, you would compile the code. So if there's like a missing semicolon somewhere, Java C will be like, nope, gotta fix that. And you'll do that. Because before you can actually upload it to the Play Store, you have to compile it. So if the compiler can check more errors, then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna ship stuff that's less buggy. So the more errors the compiler can find, the fewer errors pro, uh, users are gonna encounter at runtime, okay? The other thing that we do, and of course you guys are experiencing this as part of your MP development workflow, is that we test. That's the other big part of this story that I'm not talking about today, 
right? Software testing is an incredibly uh, important part of the software development process. If you think, well, like, you know, when a new version of Chrome comes out, like, that ver the, all the code for that was written, like, three months ago, right? And since then, it's been through round after round after round of testing. There's people at Google that get earlier versions internally and then file bug reports. They have all sorts of automated tests. So like any big piece of software gets tested, we test the living daylights out of it before we release it to the public. Because you know, if, if Chrome suddenly came out with a new browser and it crashed for everybody right away, it would be a huge problem for them, right? All right, so, so again, you know, newer languages don't allow this to happen. All right, so let me show you a little bit about how this actually works behind the scenes, and we're gonna kind of see what some of the results are of this, okay? All right, so now I need to do something dangerous, which is I need to restart this casting process, and I want to cast my desktop. Uh, oh, Mac, come on. Apparently, I need to restart Chrome. All right, I can do that. Okay. All right, sweet. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do this in an environment that's called, oops. this is called the, the command line. I'm not trying to, 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 to deeply frighten anybody here. I just want to show you how these programs work, okay? So on my computer, I've installed Java, which means I have a Java compiler, and I have this Java program that'll run my compiled code. Now, you don't necessarily get both of them when you install Java. If you install what's called the Java runtime environment, you only get the Java program. You don't get the compiler. Some of you may have, Android comes with this built in, but if you try to install Java, you need the Java software development kit, which comes with the compiler. All right, so I've got a tool called Java C, and I can run it um, by calling it. Here, I'm just asking to, it to tell me what version it is, right? So I'm using um, Java C version 13. So I'm going to, let's actually write some Java code uh, quickly here, and I'm gonna show you the process of compiling it and running it and what the outputs are. So I'm going to put my code into a um, file called example, and then, and I will, I will explain some of this in a minute. So what I'm really doing here is I'm writing a method, and then I'm gonna put in our familiar print statement. So this is valid Java code. This looks a little bit different than what you guys have been using in the playground. We'll explain why next week when we start talking about options. But this is kind of the shortest um, valid Java program. Okay, so now I've got my Java code. So I have, in this file, let me show you the contents of this. I have a file called example.java that contains this text, right? Now I'm gonna see if the Java compiler Will, is able to understand this. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run Java C. This is the Java compiler. And then I need to tell it what file I want to compile. So I'm gonna say I wanna compile the contents of example.java, okay? Ah, okay, so it found a problem, right? So you'll see, instead of um, producing bytecode, which is what I wanted, the Java compiler actually found a problem with my code which I had missed. So let's go back and let's fix this. I need a return type on, is this void or is it int? Let's find out. Okay, so I fixed that, right? Sorry, I'm going a little too fast here. Let me slow down. Let me show you the contents of the file again. So now my, so the, the thing on the second line there, public static void main, that should look a little familiar to you. There's two new words there that you don't understand yet that we'll come back and talk about, which are public and static. We'll get there. But the void main, that looks like a function called main that doesn't return an argument. It's void and takes as parameters, as a single parameter, an array of strings, right? 
You guys have been writing stuff that looks like that on the homework for the past couple weeks. The class parts of it are things that Java requires. These are parts of writing a valid Java program that we've been concealing from you so far. Um, we've allowing, been allowing you to write functions and things like this. Again, starting next week, we'll get to the point where we can actually do an entire example like this when we start talking about classes. So now if I run Java C, you'll see nothing seems to happen. And this is true of a lot of programs that you run on your computer. When they succeed, they don't do any, it doesn't look like they did anything. There's no output. Essentially, Java C will only tell me if something went wrong. However, if I look around, what I'll see is that there are now two files in this directory. So when I started, there was one file in this directory called example.java. Now I have something called example.class. Now, if I try to, I'm not even going to do this, because if I try to look at the contents of that file, it's not text. Java C produces a file in a special format. But that file contains what are called, what's called bytecode. Bytecode is a different type of programming language. And if we want to see more information about this file, we can use a program called Java P. Java P will, so here's an, uh, one thing that'll tell us. It'll tell us a little bit about the contents. This looks sort of similar to what I wrote in example.java. Let me remind myself how to, how to actually do the, uh, is it verbose? Let's see here. There's a way to get it to tell me the bytecode that's in there. There we go, okay. So now, and again, I know this is like one of those things, it's like, am I trying to scare you away? No. Um, but this is, just be glad you don't have to write this, right? You know. On the right side here are, this is essentially the contents of this file, right? This is some of the information that's stored in the class file that was produced by um, the Java C program. And actually, here's the bytecode that it generated. It's right down here, right? Public static void main. And then you'll see, get my laser pointer, three instructions, right? This is all this is doing in order to call system dot out different. Now, back when computers were younger, this was essentially similar to what you had to write. So there were years where people had to program computers by writing something that's called assembly code. Assembly code is very similar to bytecode. It's a series of very, very simple instructions. Higher level languages like Java um, have allowed us to program in much more expressive ways. But it used to be essentially you had to write stuff that looked kind of like this, right, in order to get the program, the computer to do what you want. Then people developed this fantastic thing called compilers, and now you can write Java, right? Much, much easier, even if it seems difficult. All right, so we performed the first step. Now I actually want to try to run this. Let's see if we can get that to work. So I have two files in this directory, and if I want to get Java to run the code that's in my example file, this is the way to do it. So you'll see I did two things. I, I ran this Remember, the, progr the program that I wrote, the bytecode is run by a program called Java. Java C is what takes the Java source code and creates bytecode. Java is what actually executes the bytecode. And then I tell it the class that I want to execute. In this case, the class is called example. And it does exactly what I want. Right, so this is much more like what's actually happening behind the scenes when you're using, for example, Perl, right? Or when you're using, for example, uh, Android Studio. Again, this is a very, very simplified, stripped-down version, but these are the core tools. I have a compiler that transforms my source code into bytecode, and then I have the Java virtual machine that executes the bytecode. All right, let me go back to my slides because I want to say a few more things about how we got to this particular place. All right. Um, all right, so we did a demo of this. That was great, okay. So, so why do we, so you might be curious about, you know, so again, if you, run Py, if you write Python code, there's no compilation. There's just a program that takes your Python code and executes it immediately. Sometimes we refer, refer to this as interprets it. So in Python, there's an interpreter. The Python interpreter just takes your program, reads it, and as it's reading it, it's also running it. So the question is, why was Java designed this way? Why not just do it that way? Isn't that, isn't that a little simple? 
So this goes back to this really interesting, you know, so, so the idea behind compilation, right, was well established when Java was designed. So when you guys go on and take 225, for example, you'll be working with a language called C++. C++ actually compiles down to actual instructions that the computer processor will execute, right? We call that machine code. Java is different, right? So Java compiles into this thing called bytecode. There is no computer processor on Earth that will run Java bytecode directly. It always has to be run by this other program called Java. So the question is why? Why did Java decide to do this? This was not accidental. This was very intentional, and when Java came out, this was one of the things that was really exciting about Java as a language, right? This is a really interesting story, okay? So the idea was the Java designers wanted to give people that use different types of computers a way to run the same program. So let's say I write a great new game, and I want people to be able to play it on their phones, on their desktops. Um, how do I do that? Well, if I'm using machine code, I have to compile the game over and over again for every different type of computer that's going to use it. Back, in the, back when Java was being developed, this was more of a problem than it is now. So now Intel has sort of taken over the world on some level. However, you know, um, there are a lot of ARM devices in the world that use a different instruction set, right? Including your phones, right? So we still have a lot of you know, a diversity out there here. But this was a bigger problem when Java was around. So the idea was that, and this is still true, if you take a program from your phone and you try to run it on your laptop, it won't work. The program for your phone is like using a different language. It doesn't speak the same language as your laptop. So it was hard for me to move a compiled program from place to place. Java was designed to solve this problem. So the idea was if I take a Java class file, that class file I just produced, if I send it to all of you, and you, write, you could run that on your phone, you could run it on your laptop, you can run it on a server that you create in the cloud, it doesn't matter. So this philosophy was known as write once, run anywhere. This is actually a trademarked Java term, I think. This is a design spec of the language. They wanted to make it possible for you to compile your code and then give that class file to anybody that had Java and they, were, they would be able to run it. As long as that computer has this piece of software called Java installed on it. Has anyone ever seen the Java ads on TV that they run from time to time, right? Or in print magazines? They talk about the fact that Java runs on billions of devices. Does anyone know what those billions of devices are? I'll make, take a guess. There's a lot of them in this room right now. What's one huge place where Java, where Java code, Java bytecode gets run? Android. Yeah, every Android device runs Java. And so the program, the MP that you're writing, is being converted into essentially um, Java bytecode, which is then run on your phone, right? Or on anybody's phone, anybody's phone that runs Android. All right. Um, so just to close out the story on Java, right? Now, because I don't want to give you the sense that Java is this kind of extinct language, right? It was developed a long time ago, but it is evolving, right? And so this allows us to do some new things. And Java is, to some degree, keeping up with some of this, right? So here's a piece of code that we have not looked at yet. And this doesn't, this doesn't look like valid Java code, right? Let's try, to, let's try to parse this. So this, it looks sort of like valid Java code. It's like it wants to be, but it's not quite there, right? So I've got a variable name, integer value. I've got an assignment over here to an integer literal five. But what's missing from this? How, what, what, do I, what would I need to do to fix this to make it valid Java code? Like if I gave this to you on exam, I said there's a bug on this, piece of, on this line of code. What would you fix about it to make it work? Yeah. Yeah, th this isn't a valid type, right? Like, we, I mean, there's eight primitive types and there's strings, but, like, the other the object types start with, you know, capital, number, uh, capital letters, and this, this doesn't belong, right, this fair thing. Has anyone ever written any JavaScript before? Might be familiar to you if you've written JavaScript, but, like, in Java, this is wrong, right? Like, this feels like I need an int. Um, it turns out that this works. 
this is valid Java. So let's, let's try it, okay? So again, you know, I know that if I use int here, this is going to work, right? But I can also use this var keyword works fine. What is happening? And actually, there's something interesting. Let me show you this. Let me, let's do this, and now, because maybe you're thinking maybe var is just a synonym for int or something like that. Hmm, what's going on? Anyone want to guess? Yeah. So, okay, some of the things I created my own type. Hmm. No? So, so Java knows what the type of sum is, right? If I try to do something like this, it's going to say, I, it knows that sum is a string. How did it, how did it figure that out? So sum still has the same type as if I had explicitly typed it as a string. But how did the Java compiler figure out what the type of sum is? And why does it know in this case that sum's an int, that sum's a string, and in this case that sum's an int? This won't work either. How is it doing this? Anyone want to take a guess? Wild guess? You guys can use this in your programs, by the way, if it's more ergonomic, yeah. No, it, it, the very keyword in Java is completely different, yeah. So, so the Java compiler here is doing something called type inference, right? So here's how this works. When it sees a statement like the one on line one, var sum is equal to five, it says, okay, you told me all var means is that, is that this is a variable. It does not represent a type. So what does Java do? It says, okay, well, I don't have enough information yet to figure out the type, but what other piece of information does it have? The right side of the expression. So it goes over here and it says, what are you trying to assign to it? In this case, I'm assigning it an integer literal. And so it infers that the type of sum is an int, okay? This is called type inference. And it's something that you can do in Java. Again, this is valid Java code. You can write it for EMP if you want, right? Um, it'll work. Uh, you can, I'm trying to think if you can write it on prayer learn or not. Somebody try it and, and let me know, right? But if you, if you don't want to have to put types everywhere in your Java code, you can do that. It can figure out strings, it can figure out all sorts of things, right? So this is an example of, you know, the Java language evolving, part of that evolution being driven by faster computers with the goal of, again, sort of making your life as easy as possible. All right, I think I am out of time. Um, I have office hours today at four, if you guys wanna come by, um, big projects, next couple days, finish up the MP. A lot of you guys are really close, just get there. That way you can study for the midterm. On Friday, we will do pretty open-ended midterm review. We'll probably do a few problems. I'll take questions. On Monday, we start a new unit on objects. I will see you guys on Friday. Have a wonderful day.